Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. At midnight there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Go out to meet him. This is the word of the Lord. First of all, I am back, and my family is back from our whirlwind trip to the Midwest for Thanksgiving. Some of you know that my oldest daughter works at a hospital, and being that she was required to work the holiday, we felt that it was important to go out and see the girls. Lily also came up from Chicago to Aaron's brother's home, as did Aaron's sister, their respective families and her parents. We were all together, and it was important and good. Fifteen cousins, eight adults, a boyfriend, and a dog in no order of importance. <laughs> we thank the Lord for his gifts and pray also that the Lord blessed your holiday. Today is a special day, and for all of you who are new to Lutheranism, new to the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, or new even to Christianity, this is one of those days like Thanksgiving where there are a lot of family traditions. Now please understand that traditions aren't mandatory. It is not to say that what they do in other churches is wrong, any more than that it is wrong that your family has stuffing with raisins in it and the family down the road prefers it without. Traditions are just that. Things in a family that are good, they provide unity and love and even joy. So as we welcome you to our family, our family of Mount Calvary, we want to let you in today on a few of our family traditions. Well, not universal in Christendom, a prescribed list of readings for every Sunday of the church year is one custom that we observe. This Sunday just happens to be the last one. There's an order to our year, and on this Sunday we focus on our home going. That is the center of our existence. We are a waiting people. We are waiting for things to get better. We are waiting for this evil world to be undone. We are waiting for all the wars to cease. We are waiting for the restoration of all things that God has promised us. We're waiting to go home to Christ. It is why we say in the creed, and we should say it with joy, and I, I am looking for the resurrection of the body and the life of the world to come. It defines my existence. I am part of that waiting bride of Christ. So on this Sunday, we have things that are customary to that celebration. The first is what we title or call this Sunday. We sometimes call it the last Sunday of the church year, but sometimes it's called the Sunday of the Fulfillment. For God will at last keep his promises to us that we now view in hope we will one day see in all their beautiful completion. The second custom of this day is what we sing. We often sing hymns on this day that mention the love of the bridegroom for the bride of which there are many. And while there are many of these hymns, and many of them are beloved, the one that we never do not sing, not ever, is the hymn, Wake Awake for Night is Flying. Imagine for a moment if we had Christmas Eve and I failed to pick Silent Night. One time I did that as a pastor as I was trying something new. Notice what I said. One time. People were kind, but they basically said, don't ever do that again, Pastor. Because really, Jesus can't be born if we don't sing Silent Night. This hymn, Wake Awake for Night, is flying as special because it was written by a man named Philip Nikolai, who suffered a lot in his life. And he wrote this hymn to his congregation during 1597 to 1598, when a great plague struck his town and he buried many of its inhabitants. And the people left didn't know if they would live or if they would die, even as they grieved the death of their mothers, their fathers, sisters, brothers, 
and their children. In a period of seven months, the plague killed 1,400 of the town's 2,500 inhabitants. And Pastor Nikolai did as many as 30 burials a day. This hymn has the distinction of being known as the king of all chorales, the greatest German hymn, in other words, ever written. And today we sing it, and we sing it as we face an uncertain future. This day has a bit of joy associated with it, though, because we have made it through the year. We have gone around the life of Christ. We have been to the manger and to the cross. We have been to the waters of the Jordan. And we have seen and stood by our Lord's empty tomb. We have listened at his feet and from the boat and climbed the mountain to be with Christ. And as Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. And so for us too today, we say that even as we will one day say it again forever. But there's a lesson in all of this. Just as God took care of you this year, and us as a church through a difficult year and challenging times, even though he blessed us mightily through every sorrow and distress and argument, bound up our wounds, consoled us, wiped away our tears, and forgave us, so also God will continue to do. As we look at the past church year, how can we not confidently go forward in the future expecting God's abundant blessing? If God has kept us for a year, will he not keep us forever, even for the next? Yet this is the problem with the human heart. We can see God's hand in the past clearly, but we doubt it in the future. We know that he has helped us, but we doubt that he will. Yet most of that doubt may not be over God, but over us. We doubt ourselves. We doubt our capabilities. And we should. But God isn't promising that we will be strong in the future, only that he will. And that by his grace and mercy, he will keep us. So while today is a day of joy, I know in my heart, and likely in yours, there's a bit of fear about concepts of Judgment Day and Christ's coming, the oil and the lamps, and whether we will have enough or come too late to the door, not be granted entrance when we knock and hear those words. Truly I say to you, I never knew you. How can we gain confidence on a day that we feel such a lack of confidence? For some of these images in today's gospel are sure to inspire fear in our hearts, so we must take them one by one and see what Christ means to say to us and how he wishes to comfort today his trembling bride. The first word in this gospel parable that inspires fear and questioning is the concept of virgins. In the parable, Jesus uses a word to speak about Christians. He calls them virgins that are waiting for his coming. I may not be speaking to you, but I am speaking to myself when I say and ask, can I call myself a virgin, a word used for the holy and spotless virgin mother of our Lord, a word that denotes purity and spotlessness? It is a term that describes those that are unsullied, unsoiled, unspotted, unstained, and undefiled. Because of the ways in our lives in which we have defiled ourselves both with sin or sexually, it is a word that seems so foreign as to not be describing us. Some here are defiled by their own doings, polluted by sexual choices, but also there are those who have been sullied or mistreated by abuse. We come as those dirty. A dirty person does not feel that they could ever be clean enough. But the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. We are virgins. We are washed with a blood that is a cleansing blood. Our deeds do defile us. But the blood of the love of the Son cleanses us from all sin. 
Further, there are those here who have been divorced, cohabitated, cheated. We come defiled and sick. But here is the blood that cleanses from each spot. Behold, I am a virgin, a chaste and holy virgin. Now do not shirk from that term, and do not be disbelieving, for this is what Christ's love has done for you and says about you. He has purified you from every spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Even as Paul says in Ephesians 5, these lovely words, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. We have our bridegroom, and any girl that is getting married needs to know this. If the bridegroom loves you, nothing else matters. And certainly we know what this bridegroom did. He gave his life for us, and he took our sin. What a wonder that Christ would wish to be married to us. Yet he took all that we had, and we receive all that he is. For the two became one flesh. We gave to the marriage only what we are, our sin and death. And he gave all that he is and has, his righteousness, his innocence, and a holy inheritance. So the two have become one. So go out to meet the bridegroom and meet him with daring confidence and joy, for he desires your beauty, so worship him. The second concept that brings this trepidation is that of the weight. More than any other parable that Jesus tells about the end of the world, the focus of this parable is on the delay. Jesus is speaking to his waiting church that the wait is longer than will be expected. You might remember that God took 100 years until the flood came in Noah's day. How many years, I ask, did the boat sit there on dry dock as Noah twiddled his thumbs, wondered and waited while being ridiculed by an evil world? Yet when it rained, only eight souls were inside, and for all of the rest it was too late. The five virgins are foolish because they did not bring containers of oil with them. Yes, that is right. The ones took only lamps without any extra bottles or flasks of oil. They were not prepared. And when we look at ourselves, we wonder, is there enough oil in my heart? How can I be faithful to the end? I have trouble being faithful for one day. And yet this is the answer to your fear. You do not have enough on your own. God's church and the operation of His Spirit are not like a bank account that is stocked with all the cash that you need for a lifetime of living. We do not possess the Spirit. We are given the Spirit every time the Word is read, every time the Word is studied and prayed. We have a God who said and taught us to pray, Give us day by day our daily bread. What we need from God is only given as a daily gift. The admonition of this parable is not that we look to see if we have enough oil in our hearts, but that we see indeed where the oil comes from. To focus on the oil is to be lost. To focus on the one who makes our cup overflow is to always have enough. The third thing that brings us concern is the idea that you can't share your oil It is interesting that in a world that describes Christianity as about being nice and sharing with others, these Christians don't share at all. Get out of here, they say in so many words. Go buy some from the cellars where we got ours. Doesn't sound very Christian, does it? But this is teaching us that oil of God's variety is not something that can be shared. We need Christ. You need him, I need him. But I can't get from you what I need from Jesus. All must have a personal relationship with Christ. All must be nurtured by him. The oil that we need, which represents things like faith, the Holy Spirit, and good works, 
all flow from Jesus. The admonition here is that you can't be saved based on someone else's good works or someone else's faith. Never say, my dad was a good Christian, or my aunt is a nun, she's in heaven, she's praying for me, and she's got it covered. But neither think that because of your family history, you will be judged on that account. All are judged on the basis of their faith in Christ. So run to where Christ is. Be where he promises to be. Collect the containers and receive the gifts. Focus the bridegroom. And where you see yourself falling short, lay your sin today at his loving feet. The final thing that brings us concern is the idea of sleep. Stay awake. That's the point of what we've heard today. Yet even the wise virgins we should see slumbered and slept. It might cause us to wonder, what does the sleep signify? There are three possibilities in the scriptures, and all seem acceptable alternatives. Sometimes sleep in the Bible refers to death. Sometimes sleep refers to a condition of laziness. And sometimes sleep just refers to sleep. Jesus slept in the bottom of the boat because he was tired. The disciples slept in the Garden of Gethsemane. And we will all sleep in the dust of death. That the virgins fell asleep might speak to the fact that many might die before Jesus comes back. But the good news is that we will awake even in death when we hear the news that Jesus has returned. Not even death can inhibit us from Christ's return, for we will come forth from the depths of the earth when his voice is heard. Secondly, sleep may refer to the simple need for bodily rest. Jesus may come back when you are sleeping. We should know that there are times for active searching, and there are times for resting, for even Jesus rested. So in this life, if we are not quite ready, if we are using the bathroom when Jesus comes back, or taking a shower, that will be okay. We just will need to make it to the right spot. Further sleep can refer to sin, that we become drowsy in the wait. The Bible says that all sin and fall short of the glory of God. We all sleep. We all fail. The stupidity is that one has not taken what is needed, Jesus Christ. No, you are nothing but a sleeping virgin, But the voice comes, the voice that bids you today to awake. And so awake from your slumber. Receive Christ, you sleeping, drowsy virgins. Trim your lamps. Go out to meet him. Meet him here in the sacrament. This week, as I was driving the long distance through the Midwest, as my wife was driving, I should say, I was doing my exegetical study for this sermon. And the most interesting thing I found is that the word for trim, as in trimming the lamps, is the same exact word in the Bible for adorn. So when you say trim your lamps, you're also saying adorn yourself. So adorn yourself as a bride is adorned for her husband. Ready yourself. Get yourself ready through repentance to meet your Savior. Comb your hair and brush your teeth and get ready to meet the Lord. Confess your sins. Receive his sacrament and make yourself beautiful. Rejoice to meet the Lord who comes to meet his waiting church. And if your heart today is cold to him, renew yourself in the wait. Draw near to his love and see his love for you. For it is in seeing his love, bleeding and dying and giving, that your cold heart is warmed. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.